Okay, looks like it's three o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank everyone for attending the session today, the Mixed Methods webinar series brought to you by the Mixed Methods International Research Association, the International Institute for Qualitative Methodology, as well as today's webinar is brought to you by QSR International. So just a few housekeeping items before we get started. My name's Yvette, I work with IAQM and I'll be co-hosting your session for today. You are all on mute right now and you'll be on mute for the duration of the webinar. At the end of the webinar, we'll have time for a Q&A session. At that time, you can raise your hand and we can give you the microphone and you can ask your question. Or if you don't have a microphone, just write your name in the chat and, or write your question in the chat and then we'll read out those questions. So just to make sure everyone can hear me now, everyone on the line, if you can just in the chat say hello or let me know that you can hear me and the sound is good and then we'll go ahead and get started. Perfect, some names coming in. Amanda, Rachel, perfect, thank you all very much. Um, so today's webinar is brought to you by QSR International, developers of InVivo is supporting the webinar. Silvana de Grigio, the research director, will be introducing today's speaker. Silvana is a sociologist and qualitative researcher. She will also be fielding your questions after the presentation. Thank you, Edith. And uh, thank you for having me. Okay, so um, my purpose today is to perhaps break down some barriers that uh, have been imposed on researchers and to get us thinking about just doing research. So uh, we're going to start by thinking about uh, the nature of the phenomena that you study. And I, I should need to find the way. Yeah, here we go. Um, so that. I'm going to argue that the phenomena that we study have both qualities and quantities. Any, anything we study has both. They can also be assessed in terms of time or space. They make sounds, they have color, they have emotional significance. So there are lots of dimensions in any phenomenon that we study. So we need words and numbers. We perhaps also need images and multimedia, like sound and and so on, to record our observations. It's important to realize that the method we use doesn't change an object or experience, but it does change how we recall it, how we think about it, what follows on from it. The problem is that in the research world, um, Research has largely been split into two camps, two separate camps. We've constructed a qualitative and quantitative divide. And so researchers tend to be trained in one or the other, um, primarily, and to see these as being two separate uh, ways of, of tackling uh, research. It's a construction that we've made. It's one that we impose on the multidimensional world that we study. Uh, some years ago, I uh, looked into uh, how people described qualitative or differentiated qualitative and quantitative research and came up with about 40 odd different ways in which people describe the differences. But the point about any one of these was that um, the way that was used to describe the quantitative end of a dimension could also be found quite often in qualitative research. And so they weren't exclusive. So what we had were divisions, but what we really needed were dimensions. And um, so I'm going to argue that if phenomena are multidimensional, we need, we need multidimensional methods. We need to see these divisions, not as divisions, but as dimensions. So um, for each of these things, any, any uh, phenomena or any piece of research might be somewhere between uh, the poles on the dimension. Um, a piece of research 
might be exploratory, but there might also be confirmatory elements to it. Or it might be confirmatory, but some of it will be exploratory. Um, it'll be somewhere in between. And for each of these dimensions, um, research is often somewhere between the poles, not at one end or the other. The point about dimensions is that there's no kind of middle boundary. There's no cut point in the middle. I'm not arguing that um, there is no such thing as, as being able to talk about quant or qual research. We, we each have a sense of, and we can attempt to describe, quantitative and qualitative research. But the boundaries are unclear. The boundary between them is unclear. And uh, there are ways of doing research that sit much more in the middle than at one side or the other. Uh, Bergman described these as being like two interrelated families. Um, and you know, so you've, you're still recognizing one family and the other, but there's an interrelationship between the two. Another way of thinking about it, um, and um, it's Harry Evans that brought this to my uh, attention, um, is to the, what's called the pond field metaphor. You have a pond in a field, and you can still clearly identify the pond and the field. And the pond and the field each have their purpose. You can swim in a pond, you can grow crops in a field, and you can't grow crops in the pond. But there's a muddy boundary, and the muddy boundary itself has a richness. That's where you can grow rice. So we can still have a sense of quantitative research and qualitative research, uh, but there is a bound, there is a um, an area where there is lack of clarity between them, or where in fact those terms are not useful for describing what's going on. So, what does this mean for the way we do research? It means that we can use diverse data and methods while working towards a common purpose or goal. It means selecting data on the basis of what's needed or useful or available, rather than on whether it's quantitative or qualitative, uh, so that we can reflect the multidimensionality of phenomena. means recognizing and ensuring the interdependence of different elements in reaching the goal of the research. So think, for example, of um, protein exchange and DNA double helix. So there's exchange between quant and qual. Um, they are, but they are interdependent uh, in achieving the purpose um, of what you're doing. And it means seeing the potential for a more complete or also for possibly, but also for possibly conflicting results from your research. In the terms of um, Gorard and Siddiqui, there is only research. If you think about doing research rather than think about doing quantum research or quant research, um, don't choose, a, choose methods because they're quantitative or because they're qualitative. You choose methods because they will answer the questions that you're asking. This brings us into the area of what's generally called mixed methods research. Um, and there's a problem here, because standard definitions of mixed methods research assume and perpetuate a quality and quant divide. Um, and if you look uh, at a couple of, of definitions that are on your screen, you'll see that the stand, yeah, the common definitions all say, uh, all tend to say, that it, mixed methods is a combination of qualitative and quantitative methods or approaches, uh, or collects and analyzes qualitative and quantitative data. So in a sense, they are perpetuating the divide. They're saying that you have to have qual and quant. Uh, for um, 
to uh, to be classified as mixed methods. Now, historically, um, you go back to the early 20th century and and before, uh, methods were selected to fit a purpose, and there wasn't a, a big argument uh, about using different kinds of methods together. Um, I'm thinking particularly here um, the area that I was most uh, connected or aware of in my own work was of the, the work done by the Chicago School of Sociology in their community studies. And they used whatever data was available to uh, understand the communities that they were studying. But by the mid-20th century, uh, psychology, education, health studies, um, probably some other disciplines as well, were attempting to um, emulate the natural and clinical sciences to, to um, copy what they assumed were the objective methods of those disciplines. Uh, and so, you know, for instance, I was um, trained in psychology and we were taught that you know, um, we had to be objective in everything that we did. In the later 20th century, of course, we had the challenges to the hegemony of quantitative methods and the development of a naturalistic alternative that's particularly associated with Lincoln and Goober in 1985. Well, and earlier work as well. Um, this brought about an emphasis on epistemological foundations for research. Um, what is, you know, what it is that knowledge is about, and what justifies knowledge. So there was, what this did, was to create a um, a boundary between. Uh, methods that were assumed to be based on a constructivist, subjectivist um, approach, and um, or qualitative methods, in other words, and um, the so-called um, uh, quantitative methods that were presumed to be based on a, a more positivist approach. So there was a, um, a, a division created, which I'm sure that most of you were aware of. So late 20th century, mixed methods began to be identified as a specific approach to methodology and um, so there were, were these um, arguments about whether it was possible to mix methods. Uh, these were resolved largely um, in the later 20th century and, named, and it was named as the third methodological movement in, in 2004. <coughs> Uh, I've kind of jumped a bit to the, um, this slide, um, where there was this rise and fall of epistemological or paradigm conflicts in the mixed methods community. Uh, the resolution was largely found through accepting uh, ideas of pragmatism and um, for some critical realism and so on that were Epistemological bases that were uh, supportive of the idea of uh, bringing together different methods or um, making use of different methods together. Uh, I don't want to get too deeply into the uh, paradigmatic issues here, but just to say that, that these were um, issues that were largely uh, a concern of the um, American educational community spreading into the psychological and, and health areas. It, it, was, it was very much um, evident in the in the American mixed methods community, and not not so much a concern in other parts of the world. Anyway, there was this rise and fall of, of conflict which further created a division, in a sense, between the idea of qual and quant research. I'm basically going to argue that whatever form of data you use is a representation of phenomena 
and involves interpretation and this is where we're heading. So research transforms phenomena. It makes them visible. So this involves selecting the best form of data to represent each, th each thing that you're looking at and converting these data into evidence. So whether you use text or numbers or pictures or, or sound or whatever, these can be treated as respondents' constructions. They have to be interpreted by the researcher. They can be treated like that or they can be treated as representing reality and reported descriptively as what is. They can do both. We can, uh, we can argue that uh, what we have, it represents at least the reality of those for whom, from whom it has been obtained. And we see it as their construction. We have to interpret um, what that data says. Both numbers and words um, give, are given meaning through theoretical and culturally based conventions. Numbers are as theoretical as words. Uh, if you're inter interested in that idea, um, just Google the history of the number one. It's quite fascinating about where and how that developed, or the history of zero, um, and how, how uh, the zero didn't exist in numeric sense for a very long time. So these are th numbers are theoretical, words are theoretical as well, um, they, and they're culturally, uh, culturally based. The point coming is that each requires interpretation. Both numbers and, and text require interpretation. Statistical output requires interpretation. Um, it doesn't just stand on its own. And so I would argue also that warranting a conclusion has much more to do with the research design with how you have built towards that conclusion um, and uh, eliminated alternative explanations than whether the data are recorded as numbers or text. This leads me to an alternative definition of mixed methods in order to represent that multidimensionality. I'm arguing that because phenomena are multidimensional, they require a form of representation that captures their multiple dimensions, but also a perspective in which these can build together to represent the coherence of the whole. So this means that we're nearly always going to be wanting to get uh, multiple kinds of data in order to get a fuller representation of what it is we're studying. But we also need to um, to keep that uh, coherent. So my definition of mixed methods is that they are studies where more than one source or type of data, or more than one approach to analysis of those data, are integrated in such a way as to become interdependent in reaching a common theoretical or research goal. So there's two, two key points here. Um, you might have more than one source or type of data, or you may have one type of data, uh, one source of data, but different ways of analysing it. Uh, the point is that it doesn't, I'm not suggesting that it has to be a quant and a qual source of data. That, uh, you might have two different ways of analysing something qualitatively or two different ways, two different quantitative approaches um, to, to uh, analysing or understanding something. And as far as I'm concerned, you are still uh, combining methods, mixing methods. The 
key the key thing that defines mixed methods um, from my point of view then is is that integration occurs and I see integration as being creating the interdependence between the methods this can occur um, iteratively throughout a project as information ideas flow from one method to another uh, I'll expand on some of these as we as we go um, but yeah it can occur deliberately as you design into a project uh, points where different approaches are brought together it occurs to my way of thinking primarily through data management and analysis and that's what I'll mainly be talking about it also occurs reflectively throughout the project as the thoughts that you have um, prompted by the various data sources are drawn into a coherent set of inferences that's happening that's part of the iterative thing too that you you're working with your data you're reflecting on it and um, ideas from one source of data or one type of data or one approach that you're taking to analysis will uh, um, impact on how you approach the with the other form of data or analysis and integration also occurs critically um, evidentially in the way that you record the results of the study and I'm arguing that it's evident before the discussion point so uh, my way of distinguishing mixed methods from multi methods is is that multi methods often are, are used and then just um, the conclusions are combined in the discussion to me that's more of a multi method approach than a mixed method approach okay what does this mean in practice well um, clearly you need to focus on your research purposes and questions and that provides the coherence for what you're doing you'll explore the problem from multiple perspectives whatever you're looking at you'll explore from multiple perspectives and you won't be thinking about I have to have a quantitative and a qualitative method to satisfy um, um, a requirement for mixed methods you'll think rather about what what are my questions asking what data do I need to answer my questions you'll judge that data by its relevance rather than its form uh, the methods will be integrated during analysis and and during writing as well and very much it, it benefits from use of computer technology so just to expand on on these various points um, this is the a pretty classic uh, diagram uh, but it does make the point that we need to engage with multiple perspectives we need to see multiple dimensions there is the uh, the problem that you can have um, that if you um, take different views of things if you only take those views you may get a very biased perspective the problem if you take multiple perspectives is that by taking different cuts through as um, Richard and um, Dorney have recently pointed out you may get conflicting results because you've taken different um, cuts into something so um, but overall you're going to do better if you take multiple perspectives in order to get multiple dimensions in practical terms explore the possibilities of what you're going to uh, investigate using um, and if you are using in vivo uh, or indeed other QDAS programs um, so I'll 
be drawing all my examples from in vivo for this presentation, but uh, other forms of um, qualitative software, such as MaxQDA and so on, um, will allow you to do similar things, although not necessarily exactly the same. Um, anyway, uh, you can explore the possibilities of what you want to investigate in the mind map. Uh, just plomp ideas onto a screen. It's um, a great way of just getting ideas down, moving them around, and so on. And in Invivo, that converts into a coding system, if you wish. The other thing you can do um, is to map the ideas uh, in a concept map, so that you're checking your assumptions, you're, you're mapping out how you think things are linked together. Uh, so these two diagrams do different things. You probably use one or the other, although you may do both. Um, the, the point is that using diagrams is a particularly useful way of exploring what you think your ideas are, um, just getting ideas down and being able to move them around. The beauty of doing it on a computer is that you can push ideas around the screen and, and experiment with links and see what works and what doesn't. Uh, just explore your ideas as a way of getting started um, in, in thinking about what is it I'm investigating here. So back to my, my point about designing using whatever data are relevant and available. So you might have a whole mix of bits and pieces. Um, the project that I've been working on recently on well-being for older women has used um, surveys, it's uh, evaluation surveys, it's used interviews, it's used um, um, uh, free listing and pile sorts, it's used um, discussion groups and so on. So it's used a whole range of different methods uh, in order to uh, explore and investigate the topic that I'm, that I'm uh, interested in. So you might start with what seems like a, a bit of a chaotic mess. Um, gradually it gets shaped into uh, something that becomes a whole, a whole thing, or represents a whole phenomenon. So I'm suggesting that there are a number of ways of integrating analyses uh, within and across methods. At the analysis stage, um, and so yeah, I've got a few um, um, C words here. I think co because I mean co goes together and the words seem to all start with the, the co. So um, you might construct one method based on another. You'll combine in complementary analysis, compare across data types and sources, convert data from one form to another, or compile using all sources together. And I'll elaborate on each of these. So um, the key ones to me in analysis are the combine, compare, and convert uh, approaches. But, um, there is always the potential to disrupt integration through complexity, conflict, and confusion. And we'll talk a little about how to deal with that as well. So um, combining um, different data sources, this is a sort of a weaving together suggestion here um, that uh, you have all the different sources uh, different bits and pieces of information from different sources, and you weave them together to create a narrative. And um, you might do this um, on paper. Um, in fact, the example there is um, comes out of my PhD thesis in the 70s when we only had paper. <coughs> and um, 
The system I used there was to have a notebook with topic headings at the top of pages and, and I would drop in um, any statistical results or any observations or any qualitative uh, comments uh, under the topic in the, on the various pages as I was working through different data sources. And, and so that meant that when I came to writing up, the data from all the different sources on each particular aspect of the topic I was studying were brought together. Uh, were already uh, brought together and I just had to turn them into prose. Um, the uh, more modern way of doing that would be to use headings in Word and a document map and drop your ideas in under different headings and, and gradually bring them together. And in fact that's the way I write uh, these days is, is to use um, Word with headings showing in the uh, navigation pane at the side of the document and as I'm thinking about a topic, um, I'll drop ideas in under a heading and when I think I've got enough information or when I feel confident about it, I can write that section <coughs> of whatever I'm writing. Um, or, of course, <coughs> excuse me, you can use um, um, computer uh, software such as Invivo to um, store data from multiple sources. And uh, what this uh, screenshot shows is a, is a shot from Invivo showing, in this case, the wellbeing project that I'm working on. Uh, files of different sort from different sources are sorted into different folders. Um, and it just shows you the range of sources that I'm using. And then when you retrieve information on any particular topic, then uh, the program will bring the data from all those different sources together uh, for you to review. Uh, and and uh, so that uh, also um, helps you then with the combining different sources to write um, description or narrative or to think more deeply about that particular aspect of the topic. The, uh, the second main approach I suggested was comparing and um, <clears throat> the, uh, the critical in, um, or the best uh, um, uh, contribution of software for this is to where you can import quantitative data, demographic or quantitative data um, or whatever it is that you're studying. So the units of analysis or the cases in, that you're studying, you can import their um, demographic information or indeed you can in, import scaled data uh, and things like that. And so for my uh, well-being study, I have for the people that are involved in that, uh, that I'm studying, uh, I have information about their age. Uh, this is mostly older women, but I have uh, their particular age group. I have uh, a well-being scale score. I have uh, also a health scale score, and uh, and I have also um, things like what activities they're involved in and so on. And so I can use a cross-tab tool in in, in vivo to look at how these people talk about well-being or about um, their health or about their life more generally or about the process of aging. How do they talk about those things? And then I can uh, split up how they talk about something uh, for different subgroups where the subgroups are based on a quantitative uh, measure or a demographic measure. So I could compare um, the older old with the not so old uh, in how they talk about something, uh, how they talk about well-being, for example, or their health. Or I can compare, in the one I'm showing here, is how they talk about some aspect of, of well-being uh, 
according to their um, score on a well-being scale. And and so uh, you know, I've I've determined from I've coded from their um, discussions of well-being uh, some various aspects of what well-being means for them, and those are the uh, codes or nodes uh, that are listed on the left-hand side of that cross tab. So they talk about being motivated, um, about having independence, self-care aspects of physical health, being active, social connection, and so on. Uh, things that um, impinge on their well-being or are dimensions of the well-being. And then I can sort what they say about that by uh, whether they are a high, moderate, or low level of, of well-being according to a WHO scale. This allows me to do a couple of things. It allows me to further explore the dimensions of well-being or whatever it is you're studying. If you break it up according to maybe some demographic cat, um, categories, maybe you're comparing males and females or um, in the academic work I've done, um, senior academics with junior academics, and you compare what they say. Um, first of all, you've got some descriptive data. Uh, to compare those groups. But also, what you tend to find is, or what you can often find, is that different groups will talk about something in a different way. And so that alerts you to different dimensions within the topic that you're studying. So further dimensionalizing, um, but further understanding the topic that you're studying uh, by seeing that different groups talk about it differently. That raises further questions for you, like why is it that this group talks about that differently? And that sends you off to exploring your data in more, in more, um, in another way. So that's the first thing it does, or one of the things it does. The other thing that this kind of um, uh, analysis does is allow you to, uh, say for instance, validate a scale. So if you're if you're developing some um, a scale for something, uh, you can or you want to see what a scale point means, then you can compare what people say about a topic, like pain, say, um, and compare it with the, um, the way they measured themselves on a scale for pain, and and see what what six out of ten on a on a pain scale means to someone in their experience. Or, or um, if you're developing a scale, say for well-being, you can, you can, or depression or whatever, you can um, check whether the scale points actually differentiate people's experience using this kind of, of comparative technique. The uh, third main um, approach that I suggested um, for analysis is to is to convert. Um, so you will uh, you can take your coded data and um, turn that coded data into variables. And so this gives you um, a different way of looking at the same data. So you've looked at it qualitatively, you've coded it. Um, you've got uh, ideas about what the data is saying. Um, but if you convert those codes into variable data, um, and that just means um, doing an export of all your cases, um, uh, the, 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 whether they did or didn't talk about a particular uh, topic or, that you've coded, export that as a table, um, you take it into SPSS or, or another statistical program uh, where you can generate, well, some descriptive statistics, but also um, you can start to test differences between groups. So you can run um, comparative uh, uh, statistical tests, or in fact you can develop some um, regression analyses and so on. So, for example, 
uh, in a study that um, I was involved in some years ago. Uh, we were looking at uh, what judges, uh, the sorts of things that judges took into account when awarding compensation in, in motor vehicle accident cases. And, and so we used the judges' summaries of the cases and um, as an outcome we had the amount of money that was awarded. And so you could take what kinds of things the judge picked up on or took into account in his, sum, in his judgment and look at how that impacted on the amount that he awarded as compensation. Uh, and you could do that uh, a ver one variable at a time or you could look at it um, and build, if you have enough cases, build a regression analysis to, um, to predict, um, to build a predictive model of, of what, what will lead to a high or a low or what amount should be compensated. This is of use to, for example, to insurance companies because if they know the kinds of things that a judge will take into account, they can maybe make a pre-offer of, of compensation that's realistic and avoid um, cases having to go to court, as for example. Um, if you do this kind of conversion, you can just run statistics on the data that you've got from the qualitative analysis or you can add it to quantitative data, an existing set of data and create a consolidated database for further analysis. Um, and it's possible also to combine code data with variable data and create new kinds of variables um, that you can then use in further analyses. The important thing when you're doing this kind of conversion is to interpret all of the statistical analyses you do in the light of the underlying qualitative data. Uh, so you've, you've done a conversion, you've, um, you've run some stats, you need to go back and review or keep in mind all the time the qualitative data that that data came from because that's going to have implications for some of the statistical assumptions to start with but also for what those statistics actually mean. So I suggested that taking different views of things and using different methods can create complexity and conflict, indeed it can. Conflicting results can arise from complexity in the phenomenon. Um, uh, you've got maybe you've got more than one phenomenon entangled together and you hadn't realized, or you've taken different cuts um, and those different um, bits that you looked at um, are actually showing you different aspects of the phenomenon. And it appears to uh, and it appears to be in conflict. Um, so those conflicts might come from methodological differences. You can get conflicting perspectives in team members, and so they look at things in different ways, and find it difficult to reconcile. Uh, or you can have divergent cases that um, also. Uh, stand out and appear to be in conflict with the rest. These um, problems are tackled by reviewing your methods first of all to see if there's a methodological explanation for why you're getting um, differences in your results, to check your theory. Um, in fact if you have a unifying theory that uh, guides your data uh, selections and analysis that will tend to reduce the likelihood of conflict. Uh, basically you need to return to your data and review it. You may need to add new data. You might need to create some blended variables so that you can um, explore further. 
compare um, outliers, compare outliers at the two extremes, or you can um, look at the particular cases that stand out and, and do an intensive analysis of those cases. <coughs> if you're working statistically, you can um, drop one case at a time alternatively um, from your sample to see if that makes a difference or drop one variable at a time uh, from your regressions and see what difference that variable makes. So that these are ways of, that's uh, what jackknifing is about, and <clears throat> they are ways of seeing which particular case or which particular variable might be um, causing um, discrepancies in your results. The uh, outcome from all of this typically is that you'll um, develop fresh and new understanding as a, as a consequence. The uh, final key to integration is the, is the analytic writing. Writing during analysis you know, is a starting point. I suggested earlier um, about making notes under topic headings as you're working. And <clears throat> if you keep writing notes, writing reflections, memos, journals, whatever, um, either in a computer pro in the uh, qualitative software or in Word at the same time, <coughs> keep writing to reflect. It helps you to reflect on and deepen your understanding. So I'm also suggesting that it's critical to integrate the different results, the multifaceted results, before you reach your conclusions. So do it during development. Do it as you're working. Um, and you design your results around the issues to be discussed rather than methods. I. Um, I kind of have a sinking feeling every time I uh, look at the outline of an article I'm about to review and see a section that's got qualitative results and a section that's got quantitative results. If you are studying a topic, then it's the topic that determines the structure of your writing, not the method that you've used to study it. And so the topic uh, you will combine what you've learned through the different methods under aspects of the topic and these these are the thing that structure your writing. So your journey towards a conclusion to capture the whole um, by telling a story or building an argument, you'll use your log trail or audit trail um, to help gather your evidence but all the time the focus is on the topic. You are studying a, a phenomenon. That phenomenon is not split into um, the quant aspect and the qual aspect. Those are integrated within the phenomenon. Make sure they're integrated within your writing as well. So my take home message is that multi-dimensional phenomena require multifaceted methods to produce multi-dimensional data. Think about your purpose, data, and method, not whether you are um, using a quant and a qual method. Um, I also uh, suggest that you are not so concerned about trying to put a label on, on your design or your method. Um, in fact, if you're going to label it, as Maxwell suggests, you, you're more likely to come up with the label afterwards than while you're planning. Labels are not so important as describing in detail what you did so that a reader can see how you reach the conclusions that you reach um, and, assess, and assess their uh, um, validity or value uh, based on, on, on that, not on, on uh, the label that you give it. So the data that you use needs to be integrated need to be integrated um, to coherently represent that holistic phenomenon. Integration occurs throughout a project, and especially during analysis, and it flows through into writing and reporting. And 
integrative processes definitely benefit from the use of software. So, um, yeah, and if I could just um, be cheeky enough to finish with a uh, hey, uh, the, the references for this presentation, which you can check later if you wish, and also just to say that there are a number of books that I've written uh, that you might find helpful uh, in, uh, in following through these ideas. Okay, and uh, so, right, questions. Oh, questions. Great. Thank you very much, Pat. So we'll open the floor up to questions, and Sylvania will um, facilitate those. So if you have any questions, you can just write them below in the chat, or you can raise your hand and we can give you the microphone so we can hear your voice. So don't be shy. Go ahead and ask your questions. Silvana. Yeah, um, good day. Hi. Great presentation. Thanks a lot. Just while people are, are typing their questions, I just thought um, I, I would I would comment first of all that I think it's great that you actually show the historical politics starting from the early twentieth century um, about this claw quant divide. Um, and um, and also how that also affected a bit the, the mixed methods community. Um, I, I love your focus on multi dimensions and the fact that mixed methods can mean, you know, two different approaches using qual or quant um, and not, you know, focusing on that. But I just wondered about the, the politics of this. I mean, the, um, I mean, what is your, um, 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 Sensitivity or feeling about um, the acceptance of, of of your of your looking at it. Um, I mean, in, are there still political tensions um, in in terms of 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 keeping a qual quant divide? Um, uh, yeah, there is, and and you know, for instance, the Journal of Mixed Methods Research requires that you have a quantitative and a qualitative method. Um, right, that's part of that's one of their requirements now. Some of the studies that I've read in the, that journal, um, you could you could argue that the two methods used, or the, the in fact it may be two more than two. Of course, it doesn't just mean you use two methods either. You, um, a lot of studies you'll use half a dozen different ways of gathering data. At least that's what I've found in, in quite a few of the studies I've conducted. Um, but there have been studies in published in the JMMR. You know, you could classify as having had two quant methods or two qual methods, and and um, it's really what that raises is the issue of what I call hybrid methods. For instance, is co is content analysis a quantitative or a qualitative method? Mm -hmm. um, if you're if you're starting with text, but you're counting um, words. Is that a qualitative method or a quantitative method? And it, you know, you could you could argue it's it's well. I so I I have a category of method I call hybrid. And there are a number of hybrid methodologies that <clears throat> actually, as part of their methodology, require a quant and a qual um, component. Um, <clears throat> classic um, examples here would be qualitative comparative analysis, or um, or um, even social network analysis um, mm. is a hybrid method, and so uh, although uh, there's this so-called uh, requirement of a quantum and a qual method, I think there are ways uh, that one could argue around it. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, I, I would think it's possible to to. Um, well, that, and that's that's just one one particular community. I mean, the the uh, um, 
it's been um, particularly a feature of the the so the American or part of the American mixed methods community um, that that there's been this emphasis, uh, and it's been much less so in Europe and in in UK and Europe, um, where uh, if you think back to Bryman's study from 2007 uh, or so, and he 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 found that people just didn't even raise paradigm issues. Um, it wasn't in their in their thinking at that stage. So it's something that's come out of um, particularly the American educational community. Right. Yes. Yeah, so um, the, the questions are, are coming fast and furious now. <laughs> so, so thank you for answering that. Um, so I'll just go through people's questions. So. Um, Marcy wants to know if you have um, publication examples um, for the combined approach you mentioned, or um, or if, is um, it in your book? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, virtually every point I make in my book, I illustrate with with an example. So uh, yeah, can I just refer you to the books? <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So there there are in the books. Um, Kelly um, thanks you and said, asks, wants to know how does multi methods relate to or differentiate from action research? Um, action research typically uh, uses more than one approach. So the, the critical thing is what's done with the data. Um, uh, so you know it. It meets that requirement of, of um, typically having more than one approach to gathering data um, and looking at it. The the critical thing is is whether that those data are integrated or whether you still just keep looking at them as separate pieces of data. So, um, yeah, uh, action research, uh, of course, usually has a uh, a, a strong community component uh, in it as well. It has a particular focus of, of um, wanting to create change or uh, provide information that uh, fosters change or and so on. So it has a particular purpose. But yeah, typically it involves the use of mixed uh, multiple methods. Um, and and uh, typically those also could be classified as mixed methods. Um, assuming that the uh, the different sources are integrated. Right. Okay. Um, Anna would like you to talk a little bit about validation in mixed methods research. Uh, my general approach to, to validation or rigor or um, whatever you want to call it um, in in research is that you have to build an argument. To, um, for your conclusion, based on the data that you have, um, and so you will engage in a number of, of tests along the way of you know exploring alternative arguments, looking at um, um, uh, yeah basically looking at alternative arguments or uh, things that may um, yeah. it's it's about whether you are able to present an argument for the conclusions that you're reaching and support them with the evidence that you have from your data. Uh, so, yeah, it's not any specific method. It's, it's about having well-supported arguments and being able to always to go back and show how those um, came from your data? How did you arrive at those ideas from your data? Then the reader can assess um, whether they agree with the evidence that you've presented. So right. that applies to both mixed methods um, and, and qual methods and in a sense also to, to using um, statistics and so on. The same kind of thing. You're presenting an argument. Here's the statistical argument. Does it support the conclusion that you want to draw from it? Right. Um, yeah. So it's about, as you're saying, it's about presenting the evidence and and whether that's statistical evidence or providing the qual evidence. 
um, yeah. or, and both, um, yeah. sort of integrated. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Right. So I have um, another question that's come up here. Um, okay. Um, is is there a is there a mixed methods designed to use YouTube videos or movies as a data set? Um, and how can integration be achieved in such designs? Um, um, hmm. I would just see that as another source of data. Um, so you can incorporate um, YouTube videos and movies within a... Um, within your qualitative software, if you are using qualitative software, how you analyze it. Um, it is, uh, or if you're using software, you're probably going to code it. Uh, I'm currently attempting to write a chapter on analyzing visual data. I'm not sure I've got all the answers yet. Uh, but essentially, you're looking at uh, whatever way you're looking at analysing that data, uh, you're still going to uh, potentially, if you're using thinking in mixed methods terms, you're going to be incorporating or combining that with other data um, using the kinds of techniques I've, I've suggested of, of, um, of combi well, mainly combining, I would think. Um, Rather than converting, or, or yeah, so you'd mainly be weeding what you've learned from that in with what you learn from other sources. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, there's not not a mixed methods design. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes, as you say, it's it, it's another it's another type it's of data. Another source of data. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, you could analyze according to your purpose. Um, yeah. I mean, and I think it along helps. With, yeah, along with whatever other data you have. Mm. Yeah. And also the metadata that might be attached to it. Um, mm. Yeah. You know, yeah, where did it come from? And Yeah, because um, visual data, you, you're usually looking at the context from uh, of that visual data. How 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 was it developed, or how was it um, how was the film taken, or how was the image taken? Um, you know, what circumstances and how was it used, and so on, may also be uh, very relevant uh, in what you're what you're looking at. Right. Um, okay. So, um, Yvette, I think we've um, gone. Um, We've done an hour. Um, yes. <laughs> thank you all um, very much for that. Um, Pat, wonderful presentation. And Sylvania, thank you for joining us today from QSR. I'd just like to remind everyone that in June we have another um, Mixed Methods webinar. Timothy Guterman will be speaking on joint displays to facilitate integration of qualitative and quantitative research. So your support is very well appreciated for these webinars. We can't do them without you guys showing up, so we do appreciate everyone who's able to come and uh, listen to these sessions live. Pat, did you have any take-home messages or any final words? Uh, no, just the ones that are on the, um, yeah, the take-home message that's currently on the screen. Perfect. Okay, we'll end it there. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and we'll hopefully see you next month on June 11th. Bye.